Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Dalton. I think you folks all know me. We are actually recording uh, the CLE session today because the pearls of wisdom we're expecting from George Nutt will be so profoundly interesting. We want to share it with the rest of the bar who are unable to attend today. So I, uh, Bill Merchant and I, he's, here's, he's here under Sue for some reason. You're anonymous today, Bill. Are the co-chairs of the ADR practice section for the Lee County Bar Association. And we're very, very, very pleased to present uh, this, um, this Zoom Z CLE today. Uh, George, as you all know, is an extremely experienced mediator and arbitrator. He is a shareholder of Not Ebellini and Hart. He is also board certified as a specialist in civil trial law and business litigation. And also, of course, a Supreme Court, Florida Supreme Court certified mediator. For over 30 years, George has served as an advocate and neutral in business and construction disputes in Southwest Florida. I'm proud to say that I have been a friend of George's for most of those 30 years. And uh, he is a, uh, a entertaining person, a, a incredibly ethical person. And uh, one of those really solid guys that you that you say, you know, this is why I practice law. These are the kinds of people I want to practice law with. So, George, I'm turning it over to you at this point. Thank you. And thank you very much. And uh, despite all those kind statements, I still wonder why Ian assigned me with one of the more exciting topics of your uh, presentation series. Today, we will be talking about the similarities between uh, mediation and arbitration, uh, two very distinct processes, but uh, two ADR processes that people tend to conflate uh, the ethics uh, that, that, uh, that's around. Uh, both of these uh, ADR processes uh, have uh, as their ethical uh, goalpost, the rules promulgated by the uh, uh, Supreme Court. Um, the uh, mediation um, ethics rules, the Florida rules for certified and court appointed uh, mediators and the Florida rules uh, uh, for court appointed arbitrators. Uh, those publications serve as, as I indicated, the ethical uh, guidepost by which we as neutrals uh, need to uh, guide ourselves. Now, uh, if you permit, you can take that off. If you, uh, if you review the preambles of both of those uh, sets of, uh, of ethical uh, mandates, you will find that they are almost identical. Uh, the purpose of the professional standards uh, governing both sets of neutrals is to instill public confidence in the mediation process with respect to the mediation rules and to instill uh, uh, public confidence in the arbitration process with respect to the arbitration rules. And in achieving these two, uh, these two goals, uh, there are common ethical mandates that we find between both sets of rules that I would like to uh, re review with you um, at, th at this point in time. Um, go back to the, the slide here. With the mandates. Hold on for one second. Okay, the, and put it, put it in the corner for me if you could. Um, the, the common ethical mandates are set, are, are found intertwined in both uh, the uh, mediation rules and in the arbitration rules. And as I indicated, that uh, stands to reason because the policy behind both sets of rules is, is identical to promote uh, uh, public confidence in alternative dispute uh, resolution. And these common mandates are impartiality and integrity, professional competence, responsibility to the court, uh, responsibility to the profession, equality, fairness, and courtesy, and conflict disclosure. You can take it from me. I'd like to discuss each of these uh, uh, individually and compare and contrast what the mediation rules provide uh, and what the arbitration rules provide. As I indicated, the first major ethical pillar uh, uh, that is common to, to both processes is impartiality and integrity. And there are express rules in both the ethics rules and in the arbitration rules 
that mandate that an arbitrator as well as a mediator uh, be impartial. Rule 11.080 requires arbitrators to be impartial. Uh, they are required to disclose any matters which uh, bear upon possible bias, prejudice, or impartiality. Likewise, in the mediation rules, Rule 10.330 requires mediators to be impartial. Uh, mediators are required to be free from uh, favoritism or bias in work, action, or appearance. The mediation rules also require under Rule 10.340 that any conflicts burdening the mediator be disclosed to the parties. And under both sets of rules, I think it's important to emphasize the commonality that the burden of disclosure and the burden of impartiality is a burden that is not borne by the parties, but is borne by the neutral. And that's very important. It's upon the neutral to, believe, to police themselves. And that kind of it provides a segue into the second common ethical pillar between arbitration and mediation, and that is professional competence. Uh, both, um, both sets of rules uh, require uh, training uh, in the uh, arbitration process and also require training in the mediation process. Rule 11.110 requires arbitrators to re receive training in arbitration and to understand uh, professional ethics as it applies to uh, arbitration. Uh, the same uh, the same rule requires continuing education by an arbitrator. Likewise, the mediation rules, which are more which which are much more robust than the arbitration rules, as as the new, as the experienced neutrals who are participating will acknowledge, uh, the uh, mediation rule 10.630 requires a mediator to maintain professional competence. They're required to acquire and maintain professional competence in the mediation process. And they're required to uh, participate regularly in educational activities promoting professional growth. Uh, the third common uh, ethical pillar between mediation and arbitration is responsibility to the court. And um, Rule 11.050 uh, mandates that arbitrators are responsible to the court. They are required to be candid, accurate, and fully responsive to the court. Arbitrators are required to observe all administrative policies and local rules that are mandated by the court. Likewise, under Rule uh, 10.500, mediators are responsible to the court. According to that rule, mediators are accountable to the court, to the referring court, the court under whose power and auspices they operate and who have ultimate authority over uh, the case. In addition, there are several mediation rules that underpin uh, a mediator's responsibility to the court. And those include 10.510, regarding providing information to the court and 10.520 regarding complying with the court's local rules. You know, as I was preparing for this, this, uh, this presentation, it dawned on me that, the, that arbitration is not a confidential process, but that mediation is a confidential process. So I would make the query of our attendees what impact uh, would um, uh, the fact that mediation is a confidential process have upon a mediator's responsibility to the court as a whole? Mr. Harrison? You're muted, Simon. George, I apologize. I was looking elsewhere. I don't know what you're addressing could, me on. I could tell, and that's the reason I employed the Socratic <laughs> method. My, my, my question is this. If arbitration is not a, an, is, is not a confidential uh, process, mediation is a confidential process. Would you agree with that? Yes. Premise. If, 
how would an arbitrator's responsibility to the court differ from a mediator's responsibility to the court uh, in light of that fact? Well, as a mediator, you can virtually you can report virtually nothing back to the court other than the uh, uh, attendance of the parties and whether an agreement was reached. Uh, uh, from an arbitration standpoint, I don't think there's any limitation on what can be reported back to the court. That's correct. So, and that is a, that is an important distinction uh, to be drawn between arbitration and mediation, and we'll get into the into uh, uh, more significant distinctions in a, in a uh, minute. But as far as one's ethical responsibility to the court, um, I don't think there's any prohibition to sharing with the court information that surrounds the arbitration or the arbitration uh, uh, process. Uh, likewise, both uh, ADR processes share a common uh, uh, responsibility to the profession. Uh, this is the fourth common ethical pillar, uh, a neutral's responsibility to his or her profession. Rule 10.660 expressly sets forth uh, a mediator's responsibility to the profession. A mediator must maintain professional competence. A mediator must engage in, in forthright business practices. A mediator must uh, act in a manner to posture good or promote good relations. And a mediator must assist new mediators in it and support the advancement of the mediation process. Arbitration um, is not as direct. The arbitration rules, because they're not as robust as the mediation rules, are not as direct regarding the responsibility of an arbitrator uh, to the profession, but the responsibility to the profession nonetheless exists. Uh, rule 11.060 expressly requires arbitrators to conduct themselves in a manner that promotes the arbitration process. And it uh, provides or mandates that arbitrators should avoid delays, that arbitrators should treat all parties with patience and courtesy that they should uh, be fair and equal, equal handed with each party. They, and they must personally decide those issues that are delegated to them to decide, but should not decide those issues which are not delegated to them to decide. And finally, uh, the rules require an arbitrator's decision to be succinct definite and certain. So all of those are to promote the arbitration uh, process. A fifth common uh, ethical uh, uh, pillar that exists between arbitration and mediation is equality, fairness, and courtesy. And um, rule 10.300 expressly provides that a mediator is to conduct himself or herself in a manner reflecting fairness, integrity, and, and impartiality. Um, a mediator is also required to conduct themselves in a, in a patient, dignified, and courteous fashion, and is to uh, conduct the mediation process in an even-handed and balanced manner. The arbitration rules, once again, are not as, as, uh, as uh, robust, but they do provide in rule 11.060 that an arbitrator is to conduct an arbitration proceeding, proceeding even handedly and to treat all parties with equality and fairness at all stages of the proceeding. Once again, these common mandates, is, it, it's uh, also common sense that they, they support the uh, comp public confidence in both arbitration uh, uh, proceedings, uh, in both ADR proceedings. The sixth common ethical uh, uh, pillar is the need to, really it's a kind of the first cousin of impartiality, the need to disclose, to uh, 
to disclose conflicts. And once again, I think this is probably the most important common um, uh, mandate, uh, ethical mandate between both processes, because once again, disclosure of conflicts promotes public confidence in alternative dispute resolution and uh, both arbitrators and mediators under, the, uh, under their applicable rules have express obligations to disclose conflicts of interest. Um, under rule 11.080B, um, conflicts of interest for uh, uh, an arbitrator are expressly addressed and an arbitrator is required to disclose any of the following, um, current, past, or future representation or consulting relationship with any party or attorney involved in the arbitration. Um, how often do the neutrals who are attending this uh, presentation disclose to, um, to parties in an arbitration that they have previously mediated for one of the one of the attorney participants. You're supposed to, but in actuality, do you? Bill? I'll tell you, George. Yeah, I yes, I have. Um, it, it is it is a when you've been practiced as a practical matter, when you have been practicing with an, any number of attorneys for a long period of time, the problem you get into is how far back do you go and so forth. Um, my my um, judgment on that has tended to be, um, I'm not, a, I'm not, even though I'm affiliated with a law firm, I'm not, you know, a member of it at this point. Um, but even so, I stay away from anything that is uh, associated with that firm, um, and I stay, um, if, if it's in any way even remotely in my mind, something that would be a conflict or raise a potential conflict, I, I raise it. But do you, do, you believe that a, do you believe that a neutral has an affirmative duty to disclose to parties to an, uh, let's just say in an arbitration, to disclose to parties in an arbitration that they have previously served as a mediator for, for an attorney who's representing a party in the arbitration? Oh, for that person? Yes. Yes, no, I think it is. No, that they, that they have mediated cases where that part, where that attorney has participated as an attorney for a party. I, I have to tell you, I have questions depending on how far back you go and in, in what circumstances. Um, there's, over the years, there's practically not an attorney in the area that I haven't at one time or another touched base with. And, and I think that, that I think that is precisely the problem in a small community such as ours. Yes. I mean, where where do you draw the line? Keith Grossman, can you tell us where you draw the line? I've never actually been faced with the situation. So I'm thinking of because my mediation is primarily family law and arbitration is not family law. Um, so I'm not sure that I can really answer it in terms of any practical application, but um, I'm just thinking about it in terms of um, when I mediate um, for somebody, if I were mediating in a non-family law case, and then I had the arbitration, um, what I understand you to be saying is, is that we need to let the parties know that at, as the role of the arbitrator that we previously have mediated with one or both of them. And I'm not sure that I would have necessarily uh, thought to do that previously. Right, and let me clarify. I don't. I don't necessarily subscribe to the to that expansive of a view of it. But it certainly, if you if you give it a literal reading, would suggest that. Steve, what is your practice? Yeah, I don't disclose 
in arbitration that I have mediated with either or one of the parties previously when I have done so. Uh, oftentimes, you know, there's chitter chatter. Hey, how you doing? How, how, how's your, your wife, your, your son, whatever. So I think it becomes apparent we know one another, but I have not made a practice of doing that. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'll disclose I have not either. So when I was preparing for this and read that, it was kind of an, an, an eye out there and seems to be very impractical in application in an, in an area like this. But once again, the policy behind, um, behind these, these common ethical pillars is to promote confidence in the process, you know? So what, what does the assembled group believe the best practice is to deal with something like this? Sure, this, this is Ann. I, 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 would go, I normally would go back about a year and honestly, there's some ethical rules that I think are, are uh, foolish or misapplied, uh, not misapplied, but, but don't make sense to me. But as a practical matter, I like my certification. I like my qualification, but I, I would go back about a year. And the only, the only basis I can think of for that rule is when you mediate, you really get an insider's viewpoint of how an attorney chooses to present evidence and negotiates. Um, although you don't have a fiduciary relationship, that's the only basis I can think of that would that even would make the rule exist. Right. And the, the, from, a, from a tactical standpoint, um, you know, the problem is if someone wants to get hyper aggressive and seek to set aside some type of, you know, I can't, can't, this is probably far fetched, but, a, you know, a non binding arbitration award or even a binding arbitration award it could get kind of it that's the that i believe as a practical matter where the rubber hits the road and I'll whether or not that would afford them the right simon uh george i, I i'm sorry because i've been listening to the conversation but i missed your reference initially to the rule which rule are you talking about the rule the rule that i'm referring to is 11.08b an arbitrator's affirmative duty to disclose. All right, I have a question for you. And, and, I, and by the way, I've never focused in on the issue. So the reality is I haven't made any kind of disclosure to anybody and I'm gonna take a hard look at it because if it should be there, it's not that hard to do as a one line or in the, uh, in the engagement process. But I do have a question when you talk about the, uh, disclosing as a mediator, unless I'm missing it. The arbitrator, referring... as an arbitrator. Okay, in B1, um, the question is, in working as a mediator, does that constitute a consulting relationship? Uh, if, I, if it's not a consulting relationship and I don't consider myself to be a consultant, I'm not sure that it needs to be disclosed. Uh, 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 again, it's not, it, it's not representation or, if it's not representation or consulting relationship, I don't know that there's anything that needs to be disclosed, or am I missing a nuance? Well, there. Let's let's keep let's keep moving down the the list because I think if you uh, move down the list, you will see that it's very comprehensive and really covers the waterfront. Any pecuniary pecuniary interest. Um, what would be a pecuniary interest? <laughs> a fee, you know. A, rep a repetitive mediation client that you mediate cases for that basically is calls upon you to arbitrate a close a close personal relationship or other circumstance that would raise a question as to the arbitrator's uh, impartiality. And once again, they put the monkey on the back of the arbitrator. The burden is on the arbitrator. Yes, um, but but George, I, I, let me let me back up a, a minute. Um, I'm just looking at a situation with any judge. I mean, I walk in into the courtroom, and you know, I have any number of attorneys on the other side or out of town. I've never had a judge sit there and say uh, to one side or the other, "I want you to be advised that I have." Uh, had Mr. Merchant appear before me or the other attorney appear before me and I've rendered, I just rendered a decision the other day involving Mr. Merchant's client. I, 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 I'm reading you to basically interpret 
uh, the same kind of uh, response, that kind of responsibility or action, which I've never had seen on an arbitrator. And I, and again, I sort of tend to go with what uh, Simon is saying is, you know, if you've got a, um, if you've got some financial interest, um, uh, Judge, Judge Fuller and I did, a, did a, a case or two together before he went on the bench. And I've always been, and I know he's been very sensitive when I've gone into the courtroom um, on, on a couple of occasions to make sure that, you know, there's no uh, appearance of uh, favoritism. But um, really, that, I mean, that's all I guess I can say, but in general, though, um, I don't disagree um, with George at all. We've got to look real hard at, at, at this. Uh, the one that interests me the most, I'm not too concerned about professional relationships because it talks about personal relationships. And by the way, if I know counsel well, I will tell the other side, I know them professionally. I don't hang out with them. I don't have a personal relationship. I don't think a personal relationship, I, I think a personal relationship does need to be disclosed. The factor that I do find real interesting is, is a... Uh, uh, a pertinent pecuniary interest. The fact that they have paid me before isn't pertinent. The fact that they use me three times a month on mediations or four times a month on mediations is a, a, a pertinent pecuniary interest that probably does need to be disclosed. So you're, you're right. We got to take a much harder look at this to be sure we're in, our, in a comfort zone that's justifiable under the rules. Right. And what the safe harbor that exists, um, it's not really a safe harbor, but the rule 11.080B has a fairly uh, expansive conflict waiver um, uh, provision as well. It says both parties may waive any conflict unless the arbitrator believes or perceives a clear, uh, that a clear conflict of interest uh, exists. And in that, only in that instance should the arbitrator withdraw. So I think it leaves, once again, placing the burden on the neutral. Um, I think a lot of what, of, of what we might be, um, you know, the fairies on the heads of the pins that we're counting as uh, uh, about uh, uh, con, uh, disclo disclosure obligations kind of goes by the wayside and would be something that could be waived. And I think Simon Harrison's um, suggestion to the extent that we all can employ it in our, our uh, mediation practices is a good one. Maybe it, it is disposed of in the, uh, in the retention process. Uh, when you went uh, in your, in your initial, in your initial letter to the parties, maybe that, maybe that's where, you know, it's disclosed and, um, and waived. Query. The, the, um, the Florida rules of, for mediators also expressly uh, address conflicts of interest. And this topic under the mediation rules is, the, is uh, addressed in rule 10.340. And a conflict of interest is deemed to exist under the mediation rules where the relationship between the mediator and the media, media, mediation participants or the subject matter of the mediation would compromise the uh, um, or appear to compromise the mediator's impartiality. Um, I think a much um, more malleable uh, uh, standard than in the arbitration in the arbitration rules. Uh, like in arbitration, uh, mediators may serve if the parties agree, unless the conflict of interest clearly impairs the mediator's impartiality. And if, if the mediate, the burden once again is on the mediator, if the mediator thinks it clearly compromises their impartiality, they have no, no, uh, no discretion, they're required um, to uh, withdraw. Um, the we talked about common uh, ethical uh, uh, mandates. There are, are three what I call ethical divides that exist uh, between uh, mediation on the one hand and arbitration on the other. 
and they're uh, self-evident. Uh, one is the uh, ultimate decision-making authority. The second is ex parte communications. And the third is the opinion of the neutral. Let's go back. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the fundamental, there, there are fundamental differences between arbitration and mediation. And it is these fundamental differences that have impact, differences in the process that have real life impact on ethical practice. Mediation, as all the neutrals that are in attendance are aware, is defined as a consensual dispute resolution process. So mediation is a consensual uh, dispute resolution process. Arbitration, on the other hand, is an adjudic adjudicatory process. So these, these fundamental differences in the ADR process uh, radically impact what is ethical and what is not ethical in, in, in each uh, uh, process. So let's delve into this in a little bit uh, uh, greater detail. Ultimate decision-making authority. Under rule 11.060, the ultimate decision-making authority in, an arbit in, an arb in arbitration resides with the arbitrator. In fact, under rule 11.060, an arbitrator is expressly prohibited by this rule from delegating that duty to others. They're prohibited from doing that. So there's no um, self-determination, which, which is a wonderful buzzword in mediation. Uh, self-determination does not play much of a role, if at all, and I'm gonna get into the limited amount that I think it does play uh, in, uh, in an arbitration process, because once again, arbitration is an adjudicatory process, even if it's a non-binding arbitration. It's not a process where the, um, the uh, self-determination of the parties rules supreme. It's a process where the decision of the arbitrator rules su supreme on those limited issues that are presented to the arbitrator uh, to decide. Can an arbitrator decide issues outside of those issues that are presented to him uh, for decision? Uh, Mr. Kyle, what do you think? No, they, uh, they cannot. It's, it just, it's, it's, it's just like a judge in, in court. Right, you're limited to the issues that are presented to you to, the, to decide. But with respect to those issues, under Rule 11.060, the ultimate decision-making authority resid, resides with the arbitrator. Uh, but George, person, people, I'm, I'm sorry, George, to interrupt, but if, if the parties stip to you considering additional issues, you can, right? I, I, I believe I believe that you you could absolutely what is, what do others think I think by stipulation I would agree then it becomes uh, you know agreement of the parties that you can decide an issue right now uh, in that regard which is kind of a it's a corollary but not directly on point, I was, I was interested in, in reviewing 11.060 to see um, a, a provision in that rule that was really kind of puzzling to me. And that provision says, even if parties request that their settlement be embodied in an arbitration award, the arbitrator is not obligated to comply with that request unless he or she is satisfied with the propriety of the terms. I think that's a very strange, uh, strange rule, but um, nonetheless exists. So, I don't, 
it, it kind of showcases the fact that the ultimate decision making authority in the arbitration process, as opposed to in the mediation process, resides with the arbitrator, even to the point of uh, disagreeing with a settlement agreement that the parties might present to the arbitrator and ask the arbitrator to adopt as an, as an award. Has anyone ever encountered anything like that? George, this is Steve Coppell. If I, I think I have, it's not so much agreeing to the settlement, but it's in first party property cases, the plaintiff side usually files a civil remedy notice. Then they, you arbitrator, you get asked to arbitrate the coverage and the damage award. And sometimes I know the defense attorney may like the award, but is afraid to accept it, thinking it's a confession of judgment, and then he'll get sued in bad faith under the civil remedy notice. And I wonder if really I'm going the first part of your question, not the second part, could you seek out a stipulation that you would also rule on the pending civil remedy notice such that the judgment or the arbitration award is more likely to result in resolution of the entire matter? I think that's a great, great, great uh, suggestion. And I, I think you could, I think it goes back to the initial um, issue that was raised by Ann that, you know, if the parties agree, agree to it, if they agree to submit that issue, I, I think it becomes, becomes an issue that's submitted to the arbitrator for, for his or her decision. That's what I think. I think you put something in there by stipulation of parties, they've agreed that this arbitration award will also address the notice of insurer violation under civil remedy notice, blah, blah, blah. And it is hereby resolved or something like that. Right. Yeah. Now the, the uh, I'd like to turn with respect to ultimate decision-making authority to the mediation rules. And as everyone is, is aware under rule uh, 10.220, decision-making authority in a mediation resides solely with the parties. The mediator is not a decision maker, but is a facilitator, okay? And I think we all are, are aware of, of that, but it needs to be emphasized that we're not making decisions, we're facilitating decisions. Although many times I think parties want you to assist them in making uh, the decision uh, because some people just can't, can't do it. That's not, that's, that's not consistent with the rules. The party's right of self-determination is the subject of, uh, of, a, uh, of a standalone rule in the mediation rules, 10.310. Um, the party's right of self-determination rules supreme in the mediation process. And as, as mentioned above, the decision res resides with the parties, uh, not with the mediator. And if coercion is used in the decision, coercion is under the same rule is expressly prohibited in the decision making process. And the misrepresentation of facts naturally are also expressly prohibited. I think, it, I think it's um, an interesting topic to raise with this, uh, this uh, group of neutrals. You know, everyone, you judge a mediator judges their success in different ways, I guess. And one way that some mediators judge their success, understandably so, and I can't help but admit in public that I'm probably, uh, I'm probably one of them, is how many times have your disputes resulted in resolutions? How many times have you resolved disputes for parties? And that becomes kind of a calling card for mediators, because as a civil as a civil practitioner, I will tell you, you don't want to go to someone, you don't want to incur the expense, the cost to go to someone who never resolves cases. I mean that that is not. I mean that might be, you know. Uh, contrary to self-determination, but you're going to someone because you want your case resolved. And anyone who says that's not the case, unless it's man court orders mediation for some reason, is just not being truthful. You want your case resolved on favorable terms. 
But that desire to have a, a resolution and put a notch on your belt, that runs kind of contrary uh, to the ethical mandate that the that set that the self determination of the party rules. Does anyone have any comment on that dichotomy? I guess not. Yeah, my only comment is, you know, just be careful on your coercion. You want they hire you to settle the case, is what I always say, and so I push. But I, if somebody doesn't want to sign, I'm not telling them you need to sign. But I, in the back of my mind, know just keep working because they called me here to help them get this case settled. So I don't call it coercion. I call it effort. Yeah. And, and what is the distinction between what, what do the assembled group believe is acceptable effort and unacceptable co coercion? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, I think saying you're going to get screwed in court would be unacceptable coercion. I would agree with Ann. I think telling somebody you, this is wrong for you not to sign this is over the top. Um, I might say, I think this is a fair settlement. I see a lot of these. You make the decision. But in the world of mediating, this number represents reasonableness in my experience. I'm not suffering the injury you're suffering or I'm not the one writing the check, whatever it is. Yeah, and I would also say something like, I think your attorney's doing a great job for you today, which is my way of kind of hinting, you know, you need to get with the program here. What, what, about, what about the COVID excuse? Boy, you're not gonna get your money until, uh, until two years from now. Is that unacceptable coercion? Uh, David Ross here. I, I don't think that's unacceptable coercion. I think that's a reality. And mm -hmm. if the reality, if you just simply restating a fact, which we've all done many a time, to just reassure the person on the other side that, hey, look, the reality is you can take this that's being offered now, or you can choose to exercise your personal choice and continue with the litigation. Just keep in mind, you may not try a case for another year or two because of COVID. Although I think it's going to be sooner than that, but I don't think it's coercive to restate a fact. And then again, you're just putting the decision back in the hands where it belongs of the plaintiff themselves to make the decision. I can wait or I can take it. You haven't coerced them in any way. I think you're exactly right, David. I think you're just presenting to them a factor for them to take into their calculus with respect to whether they want to settle the case. Or not. And I and I think that might be the the distinction between uh, trying hard and, and and coercion. Does anyone else have any comments on this topic? I would present it as a as a definitive statement. I would present it along. I would soften that down a little bit. It probably would end up in the same place, but I wouldn't say you're not going to get your money for a couple of years. I would probably say something more like, you know, have you thought about you might be running a risk here about delayed payment? I think that's a great point. Just stating the facts about risk is, is important instead of saying, if you go to trial, you're you're you're, you're going to lose. Uh, you know, I I've been a part of of, of certain uh, 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 mediations, and I've spoken with different lawyers who say certain mediators in certain fields of law think that they're 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 experts and they're going to side with one side. And I don't think that's the right way to go. I think the uh, mediator should say the pros and cons of each side and say facts about risks. Uh, and, and say, I don't know, but, but apparently they have X, Y, Z evidence in their, you know, in testimony and they have X, Y, Z, uh, uh, evidence on the other side. I think you both have pros and cons to your case. Can we, you know, you know, get a settlement? Good point. Um, I'd like to, uh, to, to push, push forward and uh, talk about, um, uh, when a party's uh, right to self-determination has been compromised. And the rule provides that a mediator should postpone or cancel a mediation if he or she believes that 
a party's right to self-determination has been compromised. I'd like to ask the assembled multitude, have you ever canceled or postponed a meeting for that reason? No. I haven't either. Simon? I've kind of done it with the consent of counsel. Uh, I have had a couple of situations where uh, uh, I didn't feel that the client could really uh, uh, focus in and, and, and or was exercising full determination. And part of what I, uh, uh, I have taken counsel aside and said, folks, there are very few things that the court will allow to challenge a mediation agreement, but the, uh, uh, the concept that somebody was under duress uh, uh, may be one of them. This may not be as good as the paper it's written on if we get it resolved. And usually when it's expressed that way, uh, I can get counsel's agreement to uh, uh, back away uh, uh, from it. Uh, I had a mediation early on in my career. It was one of these uh, uh, all-nighters. We did literally run till about uh, uh, six o'clock in the morning with everybody's consent. Everybody was pretty much engaged. But somebody said to me at one point at about three o'clock in the morning, it was a peripheral player. And he looked at me and he said, at what point does the agreement become invalid because the court will say that the parties were too tired to understand what they were doing? Uh, guys out of the mouths of babes. He wasn't sophisticated in the process, but uh, he's not all wrong. So, no, I haven't unilaterally called one off, but I have backed people out of a mediation because I thought somebody was getting too distraught and I was concerned uh, uh, that they weren't exercising self-determination and they needed to cool down a bit. Uh, I'd like to turn real quickly to self-determination and arbitration, and like I said, it's um, fairly non-existent, but uh, uh, the obligation of an arbitrator to, to ensure the parties the right of self-determination and arbitration is really limited to ensuring that the hearing or process provides both parties with an equal opportunity to present their respective positions. And that's, that's where it pretty much ends. So long as each party is afforded um, you know, an equal right to provide, to make their presentations, um, then I think that uh, the parties have been afforded uh, the right to exercise self-determination to the extent it exists in uh, arbitration. The next uh, uh, ethical divide that I'd like to talk about is ex parte communications. Um, and ex parte communications are strictly prohibited in arbitration, okay? Um, in fact, there is an express mandate in, arbitra in the arbitration rules that prohibits um, ex parte communications. Rule 11.070. And according to these rules, ex parte communications at a minimum create an appearance of an impropriety and should be uh, avoided in conducting an arbitration. Now, while uh, ex parte communications uh, should be avoided, there are limited exceptions that are recognized under the arbitration rules where uh, ex parte communications are permitted. First of all, ex parte communications are permitted regarding ministerial matters, uh, the time and place of hearing and hearings and so forth. Uh, they're permitted where communications occur after a party fails to appear at a notice uh, arbitration hearing. And ex parte communications are uh, uh, permitted when consented to by all parties. Query, um, must someone submit an arbitration submittal or serve an arbitration submittal on the other party in a non-binding arbitration? My answer is if they're sending it to the arbitrator, they have to send it to the opposing counsel. Absolutely. Uh, otherwise, it's an, it's an ex parte communication. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It has to be sent to everyone. How many of you have ever been involved in situations where it was not served on the other side? I'm talking about arbitration, not mediation. Content. Content. I just report one thing, please send this to the broke up, Steve. 
I reply and say, please send this to opposing counsel. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I do as well. If they haven't, I don't presume that it's a mistake or not. I just say, please make sure the other party is copied on anything you're sending me. One of the things that I try and do, though, because if somebody is submitting it and believes that it is confidential, it may contain confidential information. I will check before I look at the substance of anything. I'll check the email to see if the opposing counsel was copied in. If it's being sent, I'll get a written confirmation that it's been served on opposing counsel. Uh, otherwise, I won't look. I won't look at the first page of it. I will then notify counsel that it does need to be served and I'm giving you the opportunity to revise it uh, if there was confidential information in it and otherwise just let me know I can go with what you've got. But, but I think you do need to be careful about at what point you reject it because it may contain confidential information if they thought this was gonna be a confidential submission. I've had the same, Simon. Now, um, uh, are there any other instances where ex parte communications, where you've encountered ex parte communications uh, that really kind of push the envelope in an arbitration setting? Okay. Um, ex parte communications are an integral part, however, of the mediation process, as we all know. Um, uh, and how many of you engage in uh, pre-mediation telephone calls with counsel uh, prior, to, uh, prior to a mediation? If it's requested, I will do it. Yeah. And, and I'm finding that to be, uh, uh, at least in my practice, more frequent uh, as time goes on than it, than it used to be. I think parties, are more sophisticated users of the of the of the process, and I think they um, attempt to educate. And I, I don't I don't think it's a bad thing to educate the mediator, um, you know, early on in in the process. How many of you have ever had a participant in an arbitration contact you? I do, but it's usually about logistics. Like, you know, what do you require as far as submission of evidence, you know, things like that, never about content. Right, which is, all, which is permissible under the, under, under the rules. I've mostly seen that in the context of the participants complaining about their attorneys, George. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Um, now, private caucuses, as far as me going back to mediation, as I said, is an integral part of of the mediation process and private caucuses are expressly contemplated under uh, 10, rule 10.360 and information, um, however, information obtained in those uh, caucuses, ex parte communications, right? Uh, cannot be revealed according to the rule by the mediator to any other mediation participant without the consent of the disclosing party, okay? So how many, how many of you get everyone to agree to a blanket waiver of that in joint caucus? I do too, Simon. So what I do in joint, joint caucus is say, and is, it, is advise them as far as the, as the manner in which I'll be proceeding and seek to find out if they have any objection to proceeding in that fashion. But I think that uh, you need to bear in mind that anything that is confided to you by rule in, a, um, in a, a private caucus cannot be repeated to the other party unless the, the, uh, unless the disclosing party has consented. And I think that's really a trap for the unwary. What are some, what's your practice, Simon? Well, just for clarification, uh, uh, and I know this is what you intended, George, when you say uh, uh, waive it, uh, it is a conditional waiver. What I tell them is, uh, I'm going to assume that what we discuss, I can disclose to the other party, unless you specifically tell me not to. So it, it, it's not that I'm saying that, that they can't keep it confidential. But yeah, I simply disclose up front, because my biggest concern is if I operate the rule the other way, 
some may slip out. Um, to, to me, it, it in part covers my tail. If they tell me specifically not to say it, I know damn well that, that I can't say it. That's imprinted. If I can only say what they've asked me to say, uh, I may have a problem remembering whether they specifically authorized a particular statement or not. But uh, and, there is some uh, controversy I, I, on this as to whether we can do it, though, by the way. But that is how I've done it. Right. And I, and I, and I adhere to the Simon Harrison School of, uh, of Conditional Waiver as well. But if you read this rule, you really have to step back and say, is that what's contemplated under the rules? I'm not sure. Keith? I don't do it that way. I think it's easier for the mediator, but I don't think it's a good policy for the, the parties. So when I'm the mediator, uh, before I leave the caucus, um, I will go through my checklist of everything that I understood they've told me I will um, be allowed to share with the other parties. And I think that's probably a, a, a purist view and probably one that is more consistent, Keith, with the, with the ethical rules. Bill, what is your practice? I, I tend to do it uh, like Keith does. Um, I, I tend, I, I think um, I have found that it relaxes um, sometimes the parties more uh, when we get into the, the breakout rooms or caucusing. Um, they, they're more open with me, I think. Okay. Steve, what is your practice? Pretty much the Keith and Bill method. I talk to them and I say, I get an understanding of what I can now tell the other side. And sometimes, you know, and tell it to them this way, there's a, a, you know, a message within the message. And I just try to get clarification on what I can share. And that's the methodology I use. What about the other, the other participants? Steve, do you mediate? Steve Thompson? He's just clicked. There you go. Yeah, repeat it again. My, my, my question is, as far as uh, as far as in um, private caucus, what is the what is the what is the rule that you kind of adhere to with respect to disclosing uh, information shared with you? Uh, as the mediator, if it's disclosed to you, you have to ask permission. May I, may I share this with the uh, other side? That would be the safe uh, ethical approach to handling that as the mediator. David, Ross, what about you? Do you, what is the rule that you adhere to? I, I, I'm a, you know, purist in the sense, I'm a, you know, Steve and, and, you know, those guys thought, you know, Keith, I mean, Keith and I have talked about this ad nauseum. I, I if they tell you something, you can tell that and only that you can't bring extra stuff. You got to mediate what's in front of you. I always make sure to tell them, especially when we've been going all day or something like that. Okay, I just wanna make sure. So this is what you wanna to convey to me. Cause like Simon said, you know, you get into those long ones and nobody knows what's going on. It's the end of the day. You definitely wanna make sure you're relaying the right information and that's what you're authorized to relay. Right. Um, the, next, uh, the next ethical divide that exists between arbitration and, and, uh, and mediation is the opinion of the neutral. Um, you know, a mediator under uh, Rule uh, 10.370C uh, is, uh, shall not, the rule states, shall not offer a personal or professional opinion to coerce, unduly influence, or decide the dispute, or to direct a resolution of the dispute. And this, um, as I indicated, is an is a express ethical mandate. I find this a, a very um, difficult rule sometimes because, but I think it is it is ambiguously drafted to provide a little bit of a little bit of of, of leeway because don't you believe that parties are coming to a mediator to seek their thoughts with respect to the issues and controversy? Yes, in part, for sure. Yeah. And, and those thoughts have a direct bearing on whether or not, uh, on how someone considers issues or what, how they exercise their right of self-determination. What do you think, Keith?
I'm sorry, George. I was looking at the time because I have I, a. That's fine. My my uh, my my uh, my opinion is that uh, you know really uh, under the rule a purist uh, construction of the rule is you shouldn't offer professional opinions or personal opinions even if even if they're they're uh, acquiring they inquire about those but most parties do seek that um, an arbitrator under the under the arbitration rules is expressly charged um, with making a decision on the issues that are presented to the arbitrator for decision, rule 11.060C1. Um, and uh, once again, as we stated, not without limitation. Before we wrap up, I just want to, uh, to poll the group, arbitration mediation, a combined process, um, fraught with um, ethical, uh, ethical uh, dilemmas. Have any of you ever engaged in a mediation arbitration process? And if so, what, um, what suggestions do you have for the assembled multitude? Simon? One thing that you need to be sure of, the biggest uh, uh, concern always becomes uh, 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 confidential information. Uh, that may be shared in uh, in mediation and and you just need to be sure however you're going to walk that line be sure you have a discussion with counsel about it so that there's a clear understanding as to uh, uh, what you're going to uh, uh, to do if they want to play it that they're going to give you confidential information and just trust you to divide, divest yourself of that information and ignore it if you have to make a decision if that's their decision it's fine I happen to think, by the way, I do it because the parties ask for it. And from a business standpoint, I'm not going to say no. I think they're ethically incompatible. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a, uh, uh, under our version of mediation rules, it's ethically incompatible. There are other mediations other than what are called for under the rules of mediation procedure. But because of the uh, uh, confidentiality dichotomy, uh, uh, I'm just not sure that they are uh, uh, that, that they're compatible, but I do them. George, this is, this is Ann. Um, if someone asks me to do that, I walk in with a stip and the stip says, first of all, they've asked me to do it. It's not my idea. And there is no confidentiality in the caucus. I will, I will communicate back and forth, but I will not hold confidential. And, and, uh, I've gotten burned a couple of times and that's why I walk in with a stipulation. Okay. Keith, what about you? I do basically the same thing as Ann, except I send it to them beforehand and ask them to sign it uh, before we start. Okay. The one time that I've done done one of these, I always, you know, just thinking about it, I did the arbitration, then they asked me to mediate it. And so I, we recessed and I prepared my, my non-binding arbitration decision um, and placed it you know, in, in the in the obligatory sealed envelope, and then engaged in uh, mediation. I I don't see how anyone could proceed with mediation and then proceed with an arbitration. It seems. George, I attempted to do that the first couple times I was asked. I didn't go as far as actually writing it, but I did ask them to trust me because it takes me time to write these things out. Uh, uh, but I did ask them to trust me that I was going to make my deliberation, uh, mentally do my decision, and they just would never would never see it until later. But that's not what counsel wants. Quite frankly, they want to see if they can negotiate the deal first, and if not, they'll make their presentation. So I just got a lot of pushback that... Uh, uh, they did. They didn't want to. They didn't want to play the game that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if they say they're going to do it differently, as long as they agree on the rules, then right. I, I feel comfortable in doing it. Right. I have problems with cut impartiality once you know. Once it starts. Okay. Uh, I'd like to express my appreciation for everyone attending uh, uh, the seminar today. Uh, immediately before Thanksgiving, and I wish everyone uh, a, uh, a happy and, uh, and, uh, and 
on Thanksgiving. So. George, I, I wanted to uh, uh, thank you specifically also. It was uh, uh, very entertaining, very enlightening. You know that I've done this for a long time, and I got to tell you, you you talked about some things in the uh, uh, in the rules today that uh, uh, that I hadn't considered. Like everybody else, you, you you do this long enough, and you stop looking at the uh, at the fundamental rule book sometime. And and I appreciate the uh, the reminders that you gave us today. And George, I want to say that uh, contrary to your disclaimer at the beginning, I found it to be not only very vibrant, interesting, and I I would echo Simon's comments. I uh, I actually learned a lot today, not only from you, but my peers in uh, in this recording today. So thank you, everyone. And by the way, um, the ADR practice section would be very enthusiastic if anyone attending here today would uh, suggest topics and or offer to present. Um, we have we have uh, session CLE sessions scheduled through the end of March, but the rest of the year is open at this time. So I want to thank everyone. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, uh, specifically thanking George, but, uh, but uh, everybody stay safe and um, catch you in December, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, everyone.